Welcome to the session Combustion and NDEM2. Uh, my name is Marco Horvat and I will be your chair. Just a note to the online participants. If you have any questions, just drop them in the chat uh, during the during the talks. I will read it out later uh, after the after the presentations finish. Our first speaker is Miss Shin Liu. Uh, who will be giving us uh, a bit more insight into her uh, into her research titled CFD DEM investigation of the sintering of combusted iron finds in a fluidized bed. Please. Thanks for the introduction. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to my presentation. My name is Xin Liu. I am a PhD candidate from Eindhoven University of Technology. Today, I will talk about CFDM investigation on the centering of combusted ion particles in a fluidized bed reactor. Energy is a really important component for modern economy. However, currently used energy, they all have their own limitations. They are either non-carbon free are inconvenient for transportation. So the ongoing energy transition must be carbon free and exhibit high energy density to facilitate trade and storage. Based on this, metal fuel has been proposing as a promising energy alternative due to their high energy density and no carbon dioxide emissions. In our group, we are focusing on iron fuel uh, circle. So here I show you the iron fuel circle. So we have micro-sized iron powder and we combust the iron powder and it, a large amount of re, uh, energy can be released. And this energy can be used in many applications, industry, electric, uh, ele electric or transportation. Their products, which are iron oxides, can be reduced back to pure iron in a fluidized bed reactor by clean reducing agent, for example, hydrogen. And understanding well the reduction part is really important to the entire iron fuel circle. And this is also our focus. However, this reduction usually occurs at elevated temperature, for instance, higher than 500 Celsius degree. This usually bring us the agglomeration or centering issue. If this occurs, it will definitely influence our reduction efficiency. So before we study the reduction part, understanding well the agglomeration or the centering is really important, which can provide us insight to optimize the further reduction process. So in our previous study, we did some uh, experiments to study the centering or the fluidization behavior of combusted ion particles. And here I show you our lab scale fluidized bed reactor. Um, we have nitrogen gas, which is introducing from the bottom and it will move upward through the empty spaces between the particle in the bed, and finally, it will go to, uh, go out from the top. We have a vertical furnace, which is used to heat up our fluid at the bed. We also have a plug-in thermocouple, which is used to measure the bed temperature. We also have a, a differential pressure sensor to measure the bed pressure drop. And here is our uh, combusted iron powder, you can see. They are quite spherical and the mean diameter is around 50 micrometer. So in our experiments, 10 gram of combusted iron powder are charged into the fluid as a battery reactor under the nitrogen atmosphere. And we're monitoring the bed pressure drop. Since the bed pressure drop can give us clear information of the fluidization behavior inside of the bed. In the experiments, we linearly increase the bed temperature from a low value to a high value till we find the defluidization. And, uh, and the defluidization means the particles, they couldn't move inside the bed. And suddenly it's like they are stationary. So from this figure, we can see when the temperature is lower than 650 Celsius degree, 
we are in the stable fluidization region because a, a bed pressure drop is fluctuating around a constant value. And this movie shows us a typical stable fluidization. So you can see the particles, they are moving like a fluid. So it is good for a reaction. However, if we increase the temperature to a high value, to a certain point, we find the defluidization. So if we take out our experimental uh, setup, we can find a severe defluidization behavior with a big hollow region in the center. If we take out the samples, we find a big block. And this big block directly locates on top of the distributor, indicating the initial defluidization zone inside the bed. And the temperature in between, I mean the stable fluidization and defluidization, we call it unstable fluidization. And we can see the pressure drop is slowly decrease. This is because some big agglomerates occurs. And such big agglomerates are hardly moving by the upward coming gas. So therefore we will have the bed pressure drop decrease. From this experiment study, we can see the temperature is really important for the centering uh, issue or the fluidization behavior. And now we are working on simulation work. We would like to simulate or predict the centering behavior because we really want to look into what is happening inside the bed. In the end, we would like to explore strategies to delay or prevent such centering issue. So uh, in our simulation, uh, we are using CFDM coupling uh, software. Uh, this software is based on the CFD toolbox open form as everyone used here. Uh, and I uh, parallel open source software lines. So uh, when the simulation starts in our DM solver, we uh, solve the particles uh, velocity, temperature, uh, and this information will pass to the CFD solver. Uh, in the meanwhile, particle interactions are also resolved. In the, D, in the CFD solver, the heat exchange, uh, momentum exchange will be calculated and this information will then pass to the, CF, uh, to the DM solver. Here, I also show you a typical CFDM uh, grid. So we can see the CFD grid usually is larger than the particle size. Usually it is around three particle size. And the CFD grid is used to calculate for the fluid phase. And the particles velocity and the temperature are calculated individually. So uh, in my study, I'm more focusing on the centering issue. So simply, we only have to add one extra, uh, extra um, force into the particle motion equation. So this is only the Newton second law. And this force is cohesion force. Such cohesion force can be any forces which attract two particles together. For instance, Van der Waals force, liquid bridge force, electrostatic force, or solid bridge force. In our, based on our application at high temperature, comparing to the solid bridge force, other cohesion forces are more than two orders smaller. So in currently we are only considering the solid bridge force as the dominated cohesion force in our system. And here we give the solid bridge force uh, equation. It is a function of a constant C and tensile strength and also the neck size. This constant C is determined by the particle geometry, whether they are smooth or not. So in my simulation, I am considering three centering force model. The first one when C is zero, which means there is no centering force model. Uh, for two smooth surface particles, this C equals to one. If the surface roughness exists, instead of having one contact point, there might be a multiple macro contact point. So if we think of there are three macro contact points, in the end, we find this C is 0.417. 
there might be other centering forces based on a specific centering cases, but now in my research, I'm mainly considering these three centering force model. And the next size between the two colliding particles is depending on the contact time, temperature, and the particle radius. The contact time uh, is determined by two scenarios. The first one, if these two colliding particles didn't contact in previous time step, the contact time is simply assumed as one dm time step. If the two particles remain in contact from previous time step, the contact time is accumulating. So simply the contact time is the old contact time plus one dm time step. If these two colliding particles separate apart, the contact time is zero rise. In our simulation, we would like to simulate a same size setup as what we use in our experiments. However, the same amount of powders give us a huge number of particles. Using our HPC cluster, it, it, it is really expensive. So to reduce the computational cost, a cost screening method is uh, used in this research. So in the cost screening method, we treat a group of particles into one big parcel. By scaling up the particle size parameter, the property in the scaled system are kept constant as it is in the original system. And the scaling factor is defined by the parcel size divided by the particle size. For other forces in this software, the previous users had already implemented with the cost screening method and already validated it. In my uh, research, I'm focusing on the centering force. So we only have to maintain some dimensionless group to make sure the centering behavior in the scaled system are kept constant as in the original system. So here I show you the dimensionless group and this centering force is also a function of contact time. So we have to uh, maintain an additional uh, dimensionless, dim dimensionless group for the contact time. In the end, we find, uh, we, we find for our scaled system, uh, the centering force should be scaled up with a factor of k to the power 12 over 7. By doing this, we can reduce our uh, the number of particles in our scaled up system by a factor of k cubic times smaller. For example, if we use a cost screening factor is six, we can reduce the particle number from 20 million to 100,000. So using our HPC cluster, it is very easy to handle such kind of simulations. So now we have our method and we implement in the DM solver. So now we can solve our um, centering uh, problem in the fluid as the bed. Before we see the results, let me first uh, talk about our simulation sightings. So here is our setup, same as, uh, as what I use in my experiments and a cylinder fluid as the bed with an inner diameter of 1.6 centimeter and 10 gram of polydisperse uh, combusted iron powder are charged in into this um, fluid as bed reactor. And here you can see our particle size distribution. In our simulation, we simulate two temperature cases, 500 and 900 Celsius degree. Correspondingly, we have two velocities. One is 0 0.06 and another is 0 0.091 meter per second. And the property of particles are based on uh, the material of hematite in this res uh, research. We first validate the hydrodynamic behavior uh, without uh, taking uh, the centering force into account. So simply, we compare the minimum fluidization velocity from simulation with ergon calculations. So similar as what we did in our experiments, we first increase the gas superficial velocity from zero to a high value 
and then we slowly decrease the gas superficial velocity. In the end, we find the minimum fluidization velocity is 0.0076, which matches well with ergon calculation. So this indicates the correct of hydrodynamic behavior. Since in this research, we are also apply uh, the cost screening method. So we also have to make sure our cohesion behavior uh, in the scaled system are kept constant with the original system. So simply, we did two scaling up cases. One, the scaling factor is four, the other is six. So we compare the bad pressure drop profile over time to see whether they give us the similar cohesion behavior or fluidization behavior. And we can see they almost show same uh, bed pressure drop profile, either in the mean value or in the fluctuation. So this again confirm the correct of the scaling method used in this research. So now we can see the cohesion uh, uh, results. So we test two temperature cases. One is 500 Celsius degree. The other is 900 Celsius degree. At each temperature, we applied three center reinforced model. The first one C equals to zero, which means there is no center reinforced. And the second one is C equals to 0 0.417, which means a uh, three macro contact point model. And the last one, C, equals to one, means a smooth surface model. And here we show the particle movement in the system, and the, those particles are colored by the velocity magnitude. So let's first have a look about the results at low temperature. We can see this three center reinforced model almost show us similar fluidization behavior they always have some high velocity regions in the system. So they are fluidized quite well. However, at high temperature, 900 Celsius degree, we can see the high, re uh, high velocity region becomes smaller and smaller, particularly for the smooth surface model. In the end, almost all particles, their velocity are close to zero. So this already means a full defluidization occurs. Apart from that, we also notice that the particle uh, at the bottom, their velocity are lower than those on the top. So uh, this matches well with our experimental observation, which I show you in the beginning of my presentation. When the defluidization occurs, it first starts from the bottom, then it quickly spread to the whole bed. In the end, the defluidization occurs. So from our uh, simulation, we can see the predicted uh, defluidization behavior matches well with our experimental observations. And this smooth surface model works well. This is not surprising because in our experiments, we also use a quite uh, smooth uh, particle. Currently, we are also working on some other parameters which affect the centering issue. For, for instance, the gas velocity, more temperature cases, and also particle size. In the end, we would like to explore strategies to uh, delay or prevent such uh, centering issue and to improve our reduction efficiency. To conclude my presentation today, so we uh, started the centering uh, behavior of combusted iron in a fluid as the bed with cost greening DM method. And currently, uh, and the current model can be applied for cohesive uh, dense gas solid flow. And the temperature is really important for the centering behavior. In the near future, we would like to extend current model to include the chemical reaction. Uh, and explore strategies to counteract the centering issue. Uh, thanks to my colleague from Eindhoven University for their valuable discussion on this uh, topic. And thanks uh, to Chinese Academy of Sciences for their experimental support. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for a very interesting presentation.
Uh, are there any questions from our audience? Thank you. It's a very interesting talk. Uh, I just have a curiosity. You yeah. used basically a discrete element uh, method. Uh, do you think it's just a, it's a question? Maybe for the case with C equal to one, a solver like Interform should be more suitable or not? Uh, can you repeat the question? Sorry, a you... multi-phase solver, if you do C equal to one, should produce better results, similar results. Just, just a curiosity. Since you see all the all the particles that are packed all together. Uh, you mean uh, the, how about the situation inside the bed for this mm -hmm. C equals to one? Uh, yeah. Uh, so currently, uh, we only get this uh, this results, but now we are working on the agglomerate agglomerate size or the bubble size and the particle velocity distribution. So in the end, we would like really look into what is happening inside of the bed to see which model works well. So for instance, now this C equals one is most surface model and we have the three micro contact model. Maybe there is nine micro contact model. There might be other models who work very well, but now we are uh, trying to um, um, quantitatively uh, see which one works well with our experimental uh, observation our experimental results. Uh, thank you very much for your nice presentation. It was really nice work. I might have missed it, but um, to do the, the coupling between open foam and uh, the dem solver, which open foam solver have you used? Uh, yeah, so uh, we are using the CFDM coupling uh, software. So in there, they have some solvers. It's called CFDM Row Pimple, which is developed based on the open form software Row Pimple. Yeah. From my side, uh, what is the effort you had to do in the coupling part? Did you have to develop something or does this exist? Uh, so uh, we actually we are only using the open source software uh cfdm coupling and it already couples open form and the lines we don't have to do anything so for the specific force i only implement by myself in the dm solver perfect thank you very much hi yeah i had a, a few questions yeah. um first one when you uh coarse grain the the particle size uh, so you make it this kind of parcel do you also increase the um the fluid resolution so like do you increase the mesh size okay yeah um, I'm also, no i have to answer your question uh so uh, currently uh sorry currently when i uh, applied the cost screening uh method because the particle size are bigger or the parcel is bigger. So I also enlarge the CFD, uh, CFD uh, cell size, but I don't know uh, it is efficient or sufficient uh, resolve the CFD force or not. I'm currently running few cases using the mapping or smoothing method in the uh, CFD uh, open, form, open form solver. So I will compare uh, whether they show me the different results or not, but I didn't get it yet. That sounds like a, a good good approach. Um, yeah, also is the centering model, is this already in lights? Uh, or did it, you implement it your, yourself? Uh, for the in lines, currently they have, I think because I'm not using the public version from the, from that company, C, uh, uh, yeah, DCS company. So I'm using the version from GKU University. In uh in their version, they already implement Van der Waals force and some other uh GKR okay uh, and force and some uh liquid bridge force. But for this solid bridge force, since it is quite complicated, it, it depends on the particle temperature contact time. They do not have this model now, so I implement it by myself. Just out of curiosity, 
on how many cores did you run your simulation in case I missed it? A core, uh, how many? On how many CPU cores did you run? Because for the public version, I know it's a big limitation that it does not scale well on CPU cores, but I heard for the PFM version, it actually does. You mean for my current uh, simulation model? So I'm for this model, if I use the core screening method, uh, it's only 100,000 particles. So I, I'm using 64 professors. Running is like 20 hours. I can get the results for uh, a 10 second simulation. So it's not that expensive. Any other questions? I will just quickly check if there are any questions from our online audience. It seems like no. So thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. Our next presenter is Professor Tommaso Lucchini, uh, who will be giving us a talk on the on a on a research titled "The Open Foam Technology for the Simulation of In Cylinder Flows and Combustion of Low Emission and High Efficiency inter, uh, Internal Combustion Engines." Uh, thank you, Marco, for uh, your kind introduction. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first, before starting, I would like to acknowledge all the people that uh, with their work contributed uh, to the results presented in this paper. They are all part of uh, my research group. Uh, they are listed, let's say, from the youngest to the oldest one. And uh, some people always ask me, what are you going to do after 2035? Where, let's say, it seems that there's going to be a ban on entire combustion engines, but uh, come on, engines are not only cars, engines are uh, used in many other sectors, like, uh, for example, marine, agriculture, long out trucks, and off road, and as well as power generation. And uh, let's say, in all these uh, sectors, engines need still to be developed and improved uh, with a lot of challenges, actually, which are the common ones, like uh, increase of efficiency and uh, also reduction of emission, but uh, in a context where uh, we need to exploit uh, new fuels, uh, uh, we have uh, to consider advantage com advanced combustion systems and also uh, concept of engine which are not uh, as conventional as they are now. And so, let's say, there is a lot of work to do. And uh, over the years, uh, in our research group, we have uh, developed uh, a set of library and solvers based on the open for technology, which is called uh, uh, Libice. In particular, inside the Libice, there are uh, devices, let's say, plugged to open form, and uh, it includes uh, uh, libraries and solver to perform the simulation of gas exchange, fuel air mixing, and combustion in uh, internal combustion engine, as well as uh, the simulation of uh, intake and exhaust flow, including also chemical reactions inside the um, after treatment devices. Uh, in terms of, uh, let's say, why to use open form to develop new model, let's say open source technology has a great advantage when it comes to the time to uh, implement new and complex models. So this makes possible actually to tackle the current challenges of uh, the, the powertrain technology. Here we can see how, let's say, the device uh, looks like. It is uh, currently plugged to Open Format. Recently, it has been updated to Open Format Foundation version. Uh, until uh, one year ago, it was uh, only for Open Phone 2.2, so a lot of work for the porting was needed in this uh, last year. You can see that in device there are, let's say, some uh, original libraries or like uh, other ones that uh, intend to extend the open phone capability and uh, others that uh, are just a modification of existing open form libraries. So let's uh, come to the different topics that we are going to see in this presentation, basically. We are going to see application of open form and Libice for the simulation of uh, different engine configuration, which are relevant for efficiency increase, emission reduction, but also relevant for the modeling. So we are looking at uh, data fuel injection combustion, uh, compression ignition engines uh, operating with the metilliter, uh, spark ignition engine operating with the turbo jet ignition, and also let's say some discussion about what we, what it could be that's the next step of our research. 
So ducted fuel injection is quite an interesting concept for a compression ignition engine. In particular, what happens is that the injected fuel pry is then forced to pass through a small pipe. And uh, this small pipe has the effect to increase the vapor penetration, enhance the fuel air mixing, and also increase the flame lift of length. The consequence of that is that actually a, a low, a reduced amount of soot is formed compared to conventional compression ignition combustor. So that could be a solution to reduce the soot emission and in turn allow the engine to operate with a higher amount of exhaust gas recirculation so that it's possible at the same time to reduce contemporarily with the combustion process NOx and soot. However, advanced CFD tools are needed in order to couple ducted fuel injection with the combustion system design, in particular developing suitable piston ball that can completely uh, exploit the advantages of uh, ducted fuel injection. We have developed a CFD methodology for ducted fuel injection simulation, which is based on the RANS approach using the Lagrange spray model and tabulated kinetics for combustion. First of all, we have uh, assessed the uh, simulation of ducted fuel injection at a constant volume condition. In particular, we have simulated the, the so-called spray A. I guess that people, some people here know the well-known uh, uh, spray A that is, uh, has been widely tested in the context of the Sandia engine combustion network. And uh, in particular, what we did was to compare a result of a free spray with the result of a spray that uh, was then forced to pass through this uh, duct which has a two millimeter diameter. It has a 60 millimeter length and is placed at 1.4 millimeter from the uh, nozzle hole position. So we also have tested at constant volume two different kinds of mesh. The first is a two dimensional axis symmetric. So it was mainly dedicated to study the phenomenon in very detail. So a lot of cell axis symmetric configuration, so more consistent with what the spray should look like, a lot of layers near the duct, so that it's possible to really perform a detailed study of the flow and also a lot of refinement at the outlet. Then, however, we try to see if 3D results are consistent with the 2D, because we know that when we do an engine simulation, the mesh is 3D. So we have to consider what happens when we are going to uh, perform simulation with a similar mesh size uh, that we are going to use in energy simulation. Here we can see clearly the differences in terms of size um, when using a 2D and a 3D mesh for a free spray and those for a ducted fuel injection case. First, we perform, I said, no reactive simulation. So first, uh, it's always good to verify that uh, computed uh, and experimental liquid and vapor penetration for free spray agree well. Then we place the duct uh, inside the mesh and we saw that simulation correctly predicts the increase of upward penetration when we use the duct and then for two different duct configuration we have validated the results in terms of vapor penetration which are the challenges of modeling that fuel injection mainly the modeling of the flow inside the duct it's uh, let's say we have an inflow then we have the development of the boundary layer and then we have the outflow and here the turbulent model plays a role. In particular, we have tested K epsilon and K omega SST. You see that they are very similar qualitatively. They almost produce and predict the same vapor penetration. So the effect of mixing could be similar. However, at the output of the duct, we can see that velocity profile look quite different. And we can expect a, uh, let's say, different velocity profile with a higher uh, center line velocity when the K omega SST is used. Afterwards, we moved to vessel reacting simulations. We consider 21% oxygen mass fraction, three different values of temperature, and the combustion model is based on tabulated kinetics. In particular, reaction rates and chemical composition are taken from a lookup table, which is generated from homogeneous out-ignition reactor calculation. In order to account for subgrid mixing, the reaction rate are filtered, assuming a uh, probability density function in the mixture fraction space. This kind of tabulated kinetics makes possible to run simulation in a very limited amount of time and avoid the use of OD solver at every time step to transport a very large number of species that are, to my opinion, very, very computational expensive. So our group has decided over the year to, let's say, 
stop using direct integration of the solver and so on, and uh, let's say focus the attention and improve the capability of uh, predicting combustion with tabulated kinetics. So when we perform the reacting calculation, this is a uh, heat release rate uh, just in the first uh, two milliseconds after start of injection. What we can see is that, uh, and which is quite encouraging, that in a simulation uh, that the injection ignites later than free spray. And this also happens consistently in experimental data. And uh, also what happens is that uh, we have uh, an increased peak of heat release rate uh, when we do that injection compared to free spray, as well as a faster combustion with the DFI compared to free spray. So results are in qualitatively good agreement with experimental data. Afterwards, we verify that 2DF3D mesh produces very similar frame structure. In particular, what we are interested in is the frame stabilization point with that injection. It's more or less the same, as well as the distribution of soup. And then, here we can see the qualitative comparison between a, a, a spray, a compression ignition flame, free spray, and the ducted. We can see that for the same ambient condition, same nozzle, that the injection strongly increases the flame lift off as well as reduces the amount of soot. We moved then to a comparison with the experimental data. And uh, what we can see is that qualitatively, simulation predict an increase of ignition delay as well as an increase of the lift of length. So this is consistent with experimental data. Unfortunately, the agreement uh, with absolute value is not very good, but uh, let's say there could be many reasons about that. First of all, there is a, normally, even in the free spray, if you look at the ECN data, there is quite a big scatter in terms of experimental data. And also, I think uh, that uh, even literature does not uh, agree only on one single value for ignition delay lift off experimentally. So on one end, uh, maybe there is something still to do on, uh, on the um, simulation side. In particular, the kinetics of endodecane is say, very weird, honestly, because it has a very high reactivity in the very rich region, which uh, sometimes with tabulated kinetics makes some issues, but also I think that uh, better analysis of experimental data and uncertainty is, is necessary considering that such experiments have been just recently done, so probably more work should be needed. Then, however, say we could predict something, so let's move to the engine and uh, Sandia, in particular uh, Chuck Muller, uh, Sven Nieresten and uh, Chris Nielsen, kindly shared the experimental data of uh, a single cylinder optical engine where a four pole ducted nozzle was uh, placed in uh, the, the cylinder head. We have a condition with a 10 bar of uh, indicated mean effective pressure. And uh, here we can see the computational mesh. It has been generated with our uh, Polymi Python tool, which makes possible to automatically generate uh, a spray oriented grid for uh, diesel combustion simulation. And uh, we, you can see here the grid uh, with the duct, uh, let's say almost spray oriented. I would say that more, let's say more work should have been done to better adjust the, the, the orientation of the grid, but unfortunately sometimes you don't have a lot of time to do everything. And uh, here you can see 200,000 cells for the free spray with about 60 cells in the tangential direction. They increase to 400,000 cells at TDC for the DFI case, because we need to place rocker refinement at the outlet of the duct so that uh, it's possible to correctly capture the mixture fraction and velocity gradient that are then uh, driving the flame lift off. And here you can see, let's say, some more detailed picture of the locker refinements that we have used. So here, let's move to the, let's say, movies. So we can see that uh, in the simulation, there is a longer lift off, uh, even in the engine, for the ducted fuel injection configuration. So we can uh, clearly see that uh, simulation predicts uh, what uh, experimentally is uh, probably expected. And uh, also we can see that uh, the burnout is faster for ducted injection compared to free spray. If uh, we look uh, at a comparison between competent and experimental data, we can see that uh, ducted injection has a higher pressure peak, and this also happens in the simulations, 
as well as longer ignition delay, and this is also happening in simulation as well as in experience. For what concerns the heat release rate, there is a larger amount when we use ducted injection of fuel burning in the premixed peak. You see the larger premixed peak for DFI compared to free spray, and this happens consistently in experimental and simulation. Let's look at the suit. For the suit, we have used a semi empirical two equation model. Say not the best for sure, but what we have at the moment. And we can predict a 65% reduction of soot, while in experiment is 85%. But I would say that I'm quite let's say, satisfied about these results. Moving to the other topic of the, the presentation, we also have uh, uh, analyzed the properties of uh, dimethylether as a possible uh, uh, replacement for diesel fuel in compression ignition engines. Advantages of uh, DME are that uh, they, if they have a higher cetane number, so it will be ignited easily, more easily than uh, diesel fuel, lower critical temperature, so it evaporates faster. It can be produced in many different ways. So it's quite, let's say, a flexible kind of renewable fuel. And uh, it's possible, if it's uh, produced from renewable, to achieve a sort of net zero well-to-wheel emission. Which are the challenges of using DME and uh, in a period of transition, for us, transition is not only the energy transition, but last year for us, it was also the transition from open for 2.2 to open form 8. OK, it was the new Lagrangia class. New Lagrangia class, uh, let's say, has quite a lot of differences co compared to the old one. First of all, the injection model now distributes more homogeneously the particles compared to before, where basically whatever angle of cone you are using, Almost all the cones were just placed along the axis, so the model was quite insensitive to the cone angle. And the, the other aspect is that uh, now gas phase properties at particle location are computed with a so-called uh, one-third rule. So it means that if, uh, let's say, the uh, gas is very hot and the liquid uh, is very cold, I'm, so, I'm sorry if I'm making you blind with the laser. Sorry, Chairman, I don't want to. <laughs> you you get blind after my presentation. And uh, so if the liquid is uh, very cold and the gas is very hot, in the past, uh, the density of the gas was very low. So the, the drag was almost uh, uh, low. Now uh, we are using the, 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 the implementation uses the one third rule, so particles are experiencing a higher drag. This kind of higher drag, let's say, that makes results more sensitive to the breakup model rather than in the past. So let's say things are, let's say, changed, and we have to consider that. For the combustion modeling, we have implemented in Levi's the representative interactive flame rate model. For me, let's say, the best approach to model is a combustion. Because it's fast, it includes the kinetics, and also it includes the turbulent chemistry interaction. So it's kind of model that uh, it makes sense to be used a lot. However, which are the challenges? The challenges are that when we use DME, DME has a higher evaporation rate. So also the distribution of mixture fraction inside the domain is wider compared to before. Also, the beta PDF has different shapes as the ones that we found when we use conventional diesel fuel. So we need to improve the accuracy of the integration of the beta PDF, which is very relevant to ensure that results are consistent in terms of experiment of energy conservation with experimental data. Then we moved, once everything was understood, we moved to the simulation of a real DME engine. In particular, there has been a project we've been also involved with the EMPA, which is a Swiss research company, and FPT Technology, which is one of our, let's say, partner for research project, on the development of a dimethyliter engine, in particular the conversion of a diesel engine to DME. Results were quite impressive, 12% reduction of CO2, of course, at the test bench, not only in simulation, which is, let's say, the most important part, uh, break thermal efficiency above 40 percent with less than one gram per kilowatt hour of uh, NOx, thanks to the fact that uh, the ME has a soot free combustion, so that it's possible to push a lot on exhaust gas circulation and five times less uh, unburned um, hydrocarbon. Here we can see the computational mesh, our Python tool. You start from combustion chamber STL injection direction, automatically builds up a block structure grid and the mesh here. Two operating point, 25% to 75% of the load, and then important to keep 
So uh, suitable boundary conditions, in particular injection profile is very important. And in this case, thanks to the needle lift measurements, it has been possible to provide to the code suitable uh, profiles of fuel injection rate. So then we can see here the agreement between computed and experimental data using open form 8 or open form Libai 8 and open form 22x and Libai 2 uh, and Libai 22x. You see that now, thanks to the different modeling of the spray, the mixing change and the agreement between compute and experimental data is much better now that we have moved to the new version. Let's move on with another aspect, which is, let's say, quite of interest now for basically heavy duty and also marine engine, is the use of this active pre-chamber. So in spark ignition engine, uh, the uh, fuel is uh, port injected to generate a lean mixture inside the cylinder, but also a little amount of fuel is injected inside the pre-chamber. So that what we can realize is a rich stoichiometric mixture in the pre-chamber, and then the hot fuel jets are igniting the lean mixture inside the cylinder. The advantage of that is that we can, with the active pre-chamber, increase the engine efficiency, extend the lean limits thanks to higher combustion stability and reduce the carbon oxide and anhydride carbon emissions for where the emissions are used. This work is part of, uh, let's say, a long uh, work that started with the uh, HD gas, with, uh, with, which was a European project. The idea was to develop uh, a pent roof spark ignition engine with corona discharge with uh, natural gas fuel to replace diesel. Then, let's say, after the project, the idea was, okay, let's uh, move back to a conventional cylinder head with the uh, swirl, and uh, let's think about uh, swirl and together with Prechem. These two movies, of course, uh, full cycle simulation of two engines performed with device, performed with device since uh, 2007. So, I don't know, now from foundation claims they can do full cycle simulation of well, as well. Guess where the procedure comes from? So then we can see the uh, procedure that we developed for the modeling of uh, turbo inject ignition engine. In particular, in the pre-chamber, we need to take care of gas exchange. So the idea is to do gas exchange in the pre-chamber only from start of injection to IVC with the pressure boundary conditions coming from, I don't know, 1D data. So this makes possible only to focus on the pre-chamber. And then when the valves are closed, the computed flow feed in the pre-chamber is mapped on the combustion chamber mesh. And it's possible, maybe we can also use a sector mesh to reduce the computational time. Let's then move to results, in particular to the validation of this approach. We have uh, performed validation on a single cylinder engine with the pre-chamber. Here we can see we consider the effect of the air excess. We move the from relative air flow ratio 1.5 to 1.9. Here we can see detail. This is just a cut of a 45 degree sector mesh with a grid size, which is about 0.2 millimeters inside the nozzle. It's a jet oriented. I would like to stress numerical diffusion. When you do um, jet and spray is very important. And if you don't orient your grid like the jet, you're going to lose something that no way, even with the very, very smallest grid size that you want. So it's important, let's say, to preserve some sort of grid orientation to improve results. We have used the weather combustion model. Weather combustion model is great because it's the only combustion model that is solving implicitly for the combustion regress variable. So it's the most consistent as you can get. It's almost independent on the time step. It's less affected by uh, noise, I would say, in the simulation. Of course, it needs some improvements, like uh, a suitable model to describe the transition from laminar to turbulent frame propagation. Methane, lean methane, okay, 1.5 to 1.9, high pressure, we cannot use the Galdeck correlation. So we tabulated laminar free speed, performing the take kinetics calculation at uh, for a wide range of conditions. And finally, for the ratio between turbulent and laminar free speed, we decided to use the Peter Kohler ratio instead of the Gulder one, because we will see the reason later. So, first of all, some pictures of the gas exchange in the pre-chamber. 
This is the injection of fuel, and uh, this is the flow, the flow field together with the turbulence intensity. At IVC, let's say the pre-chamber is almost full of fuel. That's why the mixture here is uh, very rich. And then uh, during compression, uh, the lean mixture enters in the pre-chamber due to the piston compression, giving an air fuel ratio which is around uh, one, which is what we would like, a relative air fuel ratio which is around one, which is what we want to expect. So you need a pressure. Result are in rather good agreement with experimental data, but I would also like to stress that qualitative literalism rate clearly predicts the two different stages of combustion. One which is mainly hot gas jet driven, and then the second one, which is just, uh, let's say, conventional pre preparation after the ignition is established inside the main chamber. And here you can see the combustion movie. So we have uh, jet that enters in the chamber and then the flame propagation. In terms of combustion regimes, uh, what we can see, when ignition starts, we are in the flamelet regimes. But then when the jet comes out, this is the borghi peters diagram, the combustion regimes are uh, very far from corrugated flamelets. So we need a combustion model that is able to predict uh, this kind of multi-regime combustion from corrugated and wrinkled flamelet up to Karlovitz equal to 100. And that's why we decided basically to combine the Weller model with the Peters correlation. Let's... Uh, then think about what to do next. Let's say we are still working a lot on NG research and what we, are what we are doing now. Rotary engines, because they are quite interesting for aerospace sector as well as for range extender. And this is by combining mesh deformation, in particular dynamic interpolated FV mesh together with that. Marine engines, because at the moment they are the biggest challenge. Yesterday, you see a lot of work on the improvement of the ship because it makes sense if we have to use new fuels to improve everything, not only the engine, but on the engine side, we need to use new dual fuel combustion system like this one, diesel plus hydrogen, diesel plus methane, diesel plus ammonia. Injection of natural gas to achieve dual fuel operation in these two-stroke marine engines, new mesh management, which is again ACMI plus layer additional removal or advanced engine concepts like, for example, the free piston linear generator, where basically the piston, oh, the piston motion is uh, regulated by the uh, resistance force from the linear generator, the um, pressure inside the cylinder and the pressure in the rebound chip. Just to conclude, before concluding my talk, I would like to just show you what we do at, uh, with Open Foam at Polytechnic and the, the Open Foam engine community. Every two years, we, we do a PhD interdoctoral course uh, called the Computational Fluid Dynamics with open, with open Source Software. 50 attendees uh, in the last edition. And uh, let's say it's open, free to PhD students from other universities. So if you are interested, think about it, uh, basically. And we have uh, top lecturers from this community. So. We have the this year, Philip Cardiff, uh, um, and uh, um, as well as Ogre as uh, teachers. And the next edition will be January 2024. Every two years, we also organize a little workshop about uh, simulation of internal combustion engines with open foam. We organize it with uh, Dance at University, in particular the group of Professor Hasse. Here you can see the first post-pandemic edition we all met in Darstand uh, in uh, last May with about 40 people. And again, we're going to have a next edition in 2024. And from our group also, a little uh, company called Sursumi was, uh, let's say, originated in order to, let's say, provide the services in terms of uh, um, for uh, IC engine and uh, uh, powertrain simulation with open foam and Levi's. So just to conclude my talk, uh, open foam, you can see it's, uh, let's say, quite a powerful tool to develop new model, which could be really used to tackle the challenges of the future of internal combustion engines, because uh, new model development is easy, fast adaptation and combination of existing approaches to take a new combustion system and fuel, model development, and also in general, the development of a full integrated methodology for model assessment, validation, and application, which is very important, I think, in a transition time where, let's say, a lot of things are changed. With this, I would like to thank you all for your attention and be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Professor Lucchini. Very impressive work, very Thank impressive you. work. Uh, any questions from the audience?
Hello. Uh, yeah, thank you for a very nice presentations. So I have a few questions re regarding the Lagrangian model injection part. Mm -hmm. So um, what do you th why do you think um, the new versions, like a more homogeneous distribution gives a better result? Uh, okay, thank you very much for your question. So um, I think that uh, people at uh, CFD Direct, I think this is the name of the company, they've realized that uh, this is uh, not uh, probably consistent when you want to inject the droplets in a core. So it's clear that uh, if we want to say what the, who is right, this is probably the right distribution. So if you inject uh, all the droplets along mainly the axis, uh, what you're going to have is mainly just an axial velocity, which is strong because most of the droplets only go in that direction. So the, the droplet at the periphery of the cone will not really have any, any effect on the entrainment of air, on the morphology of the jet and on the evaporation process. So that's, that's why you will experience, for example, a, a reduced spray penetration. Yeah, okay. Uh... Yeah. Um, then the second question is, how do you do the in, uh, particles initial, initialization okay. about the velo particles velocity? Okay. Uh, from the injection rate. We have injection rate, we have the uh, diameter, and we normally have uh, um, a diameter that is equal to the nozzle diameter. And then we try to tune the breakup model to achieve some sort of atomization in secondary breakup. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, yeah, my question is also related to the Lagrangian spray. I was wondering which uh, breakup model you are using. Uh, okay, uh, depending on on many things, we have our own implementation of KHRT, which is, uh, I think, uh, more evolved compared to what you can find in the foundation version or in the other version, because say, we try to follow all the literature related what is in the current open font, in my opinion, is just, let's say, a first approximation of what KHRT is. Sometimes we also use rates the vacuum. In the past, uh, let's say, rates KHRT, also because of this way particles were injected, of the fact that the model were sensitive to breakup models, uh, was producing a huge amount of droplet. Now it isn't. So I generally always use KHRT. Okay, thank you. And one question from my side. Uh, it is not probably the most uh, relevant uh, relevant topic, but uh, I like Python. I like meshing. So mm -hmm. I was just wondering if the Python meshing tool you you mentioned uh, is it available? Just to take a look at it. Why not? Yeah, absolutely. Just send us an email and okay, you can, perfect. You can uh, let's say absolutely for sure. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. It's it's available because it's you that invited me here. So <laughs> you need the punishment of looking at our code. Yeah, thank you very much for the presentation. Follow up with the question from the previous. Uh, um, you said that you could make the available via sending a mail. Would you consider like uh, making a journal publication in like the Open Form Journal with both this? more advanced solver and also the meshing techniques would be interesting for the community? For, let's say, our policy at the moment, uh, which is always the same policy since 2006, is that if, if a university is interested, we are open to collaborate and uh, to share everything. The sharing publicly of all the code sometimes could be complicated if you rely on your funding just by sharing it completely. So. But if a university is interested, we are, say, completely open to, to, to share anything is needed, provided that we think about common work, common paper, mm -hmm. and common developments. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for your wonderful presentation. You mentioned the need to do more accurate integration of the uh, beta yeah. uh, PDF. beta PDF distribution. Mm -hmm. So how do you go about doing the integration and how do you do the implementation? Okay, so um, that is quite a long story because 
what we do with the riff is basically solving uh, the flamelet equation in a 1D mesh. Sorry if I go on the, sorry, search the slide. Okay, we solve uh, the flamelet equation in a 1D mesh, which is about 200 cells. We solve it with finite volume method and so on. Then we have a sort of very fine interpolation mesh that we use for the integration of the beta PDF. So in extreme cases where the integration error that we fortunately know, because if we integrate P of Z dz, we should get Z. And if we don't get it, we use the very fine interpolation mesh to get out the values of the composition. So if I understand you, you use a fixed mesh to do the integration. Yes. Have you thought about doing an adaptive integration technique? If you, the problem is that you should do online. Since RIF works online, you cannot really have a lot of, uh, let's say, you have just one shot for the integration. You can make more, otherwise simulation will be too long. Okay. We can do adaptive and we do it when we do tabulation. I see. Any other questions? Uh, if not, I will just quickly check if there is something from the online audience. Seems like nothing from the online okay. audience. Let's Good. thank once again our speaker. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is uh, gentleman Mahmoud Gadala, and he will be. Uh, uh, he will tell us a bit more about his study titled Local Numerical Mis Mi Microscopy of uh, Dual Fuel Spray Combustion. Thank you so much. Um, hello, everyone. My name is uh, Mahmoud Gadalla. I'm a doctoral researcher at Alt University uh, School of Engineering. And um, in this talk, I will discuss uh, the uh, utilization of open foam for performing uh, local numerical microscopy of uh, dual fuel uh, spray combustion. Um, I would also like to acknowledge the uh, co-authorship of um, Dr. Shervin Karim Kashi, Professor Ossikario, and Professor Ville Voronin from Alt University, and also the international collaboration of Islam Kabil and Professor Tian Feng Lu from University of Connecticut. The um, contents of uh, this presentation will be uh, rather uh, a bit of a blend between uh, combustion physics and uh, high performance computing slash software development. Uh, in particular, in the first uh, part of the presentation, uh, I will provide some um, conceptual background on what is dual fuel uh, combustion and uh, what are the characteristic features that uh, actually distinguish uh, the um, operation of uh, the dual fuel uh, spray combustion from the conventional um, uh, single fuel uh, spray combustion, and uh, also what are the uh, main um, uh, research questions that uh, uh, we will be interested in uh, addressing in this uh, numerical study. Uh, in the second uh, part, and this uh, I would say the main uh, uh, content of, uh, of this uh, presentation, um, I will shift the attention a bit uh, to focus more on um, on numerics and high performance computing and um, uh, highlight some of the uh, development efforts that have been uh, uh, made at, uh, at Alto University to uh, accelerate the computational performance uh, for um, um, uh, highly parallelized reactive flow uh, simulations and also uh, what are the um, uh, main uh, uh, HPC strategies that uh, we have uh, made in order to achieve uh, uh, a linear scaling uh, for uh, a highly uh, parallelized combustion system using um, about 11,000 cores. Uh, and in the third part, I will uh, switch back to uh, physics and um, uh, talk uh, a bit about, uh, very briefly, uh, about the um, uh, some of the uh, physics and uh, and some of the results that are uh, related to this um, uh, computational study. And also I will highlight uh, quickly also a library development that help, uh, help us in this uh, analysis. So uh, what is dual fuel combustion? As the name suggests here, we have two different uh, fuels. Uh, one of them is uh, uh, so-called low reactivity fuel 
And by that, we mean um, uh, we introduce uh, uh, lorry activity uh, uh, fuel uh, uh, in order to provide the main combustion energy uh, in our system. So here we talk about 85 to 98 percent of, uh, of the uh, combustion energy is coming uh, from this uh, lorry activity fuel. And it is depicted uh, in the uh, right figure by this um, uh, green uh, color. Uh, this lorry activity fuel has uh, much lower uh, carbon content, so uh, we also uh, uh, expect that um, we will have much lower uh, emissions uh, because of uh, that and for, uh, therefore mitigate the uh, environmental concerns regarding the uh, utilization of, um, of carbonaceous combustion. Um, on the other hand, a lorry activity fuel, um, uh, well, it's... It, by definition, it has uh, uh, resistance to auto ignite, and therefore, we need some sort of facilitator uh, to uh, initiate the combustion in our system, and that's why we make use of a um, uh, low quantities of uh, high reactivity fuel to act as the ignition source uh, in our uh, system. Uh, this um, uh, spray uh, quantities are injected uh, in uh, very little. Uh, 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 quantities yet sufficient to uh, initiate and sustain uh, the combustion in our system. Apart from the operational uh, variation between dual fuel and single fuel uh, combustion, we also have um, uh, the dynamics and uh, the modes of combustion uh, are expected to be very different from the conventional uh, single fuel uh, spray combustion. Um, so, for instance, in the single fuel uh, combustion, uh, we would, uh, it is known that uh, um, we have a turbulent diffusion uh, combustion mode, which means that um, the combustion rate is limited by the molecular diffusion between the non premixed reactants. On the other hand, uh, little information is, uh, is uh, uh, available in literature regarding the uh, dual fuel uh, combustion. However, we would expect that. Um, uh, we would have uh, uh, first uh, an auto ignition based uh, uh, combustion mode uh, phenomena due to the uh, initiation of the combustion from the uh, spray. And after that, uh, we expect to have um, a slow uh, combustion uh, uh, or a slow premixed combustion uh, due to the um, uh, burning of the low reactivity fuel that is uh, already premixed uh, in the combustion chamber. Uh, which was introduced in a much earlier uh, phase in the combustion uh, cycle. So this drives us to uh, the main objectives of this study, which is uh, we would like to analyze the uh, mode of combustion in uh, dual fuel systems. Um, in order to do that, we uh, shift the focus in a, a very small window of spatiotemporal details uh, uh, and by small window here, we talk about a uh, few millimeters in length and uh, less than uh, 0.5 uh, milliseconds in, uh, in simulation time. Uh, we needed to uh, fully resolve uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, main investigation region, which is marked in this uh, greenish uh, color. Uh, on the other hand, we uh, still want to uh, provide the turbulence uh, in our system, and uh, that is why uh, we still have a background uh, large eddy uh, simulation, um, which is depicted in this uh, red uh, uh, red zone. Uh, so basically, we have a rather uh, multi-resolution uh, um, uh, simulation where LES is performed in the background to resolve the uh, spray and uh, provide turbulence uh, to the uh, main investigation zone, which is uh, the embedded uh, uh, as we call embedded quasi DNS zone. The thermophysical conditions, as it was also mentioned by Professor Lucchini, it is the spray A target conditions, which is known in the engine combustion network. Uh, we had to modify these uh, conditions in order to operate in uh, dual fuel mode. So this means that we uh, introduced also the low reactivity fuel, which is uh, methane uh, in our case. Uh, the remaining uh, uh, conditions are uh, relevant to uh, engine relevant uh, uh, or related to uh, uh, actual engine uh, conditions. Uh, when it comes to the governing equations, uh, 
we basically need to uh, accommodate or account uh, for uh, turbulence, for uh, phase change, and also for uh, chemical reactions. Uh, the uh, provided set of equations here, they um, are able to, um, to model uh, these uh, phenomena. Um, they are quite, uh, I would say, familiar. Um, maybe the terms on the right here, they note the, uh, the uh, source terms uh, coming from the uh, uh, heat and mass transfer of the uh, liquid spray. And uh, then we have also the um, chemical source terms, uh, omega dot uh, in red. Uh, here we uh, used um, direct integration of, uh, of finite rate chemistry. Uh, I would say, um, uh, well, in our in our case, uh, we have um, a highly uh, localized uh, uh, investigation uh, uh, zone. So uh, we uh, were aiming to uh, uh, perform as accurate simulations as uh, as possible. Um, uh, we basically have, uh, uh, as uh, also Professor uh, Lucchini mentioned, uh, uh, a stiff or uh, nonlinear initial value problem uh, to be uh, integrated, and uh, and below here are the um, uh, the basis uh, for the integration scheme, um, um, uh, and and this uh, problem uh, needs to be solved for each computational cell uh, for each uh, time step. So. Uh, uh, it is it is widely known that uh, finite rate chemistry and species transport uh, can account to over ninety percent of uh, the total computational time, and uh, therefore we needed to focus the efforts on how to uh, further accelerate the um, solution strategies for this uh, kind of uh, problems. So uh, the first thing is uh, we started looking into the uh, different. Uh, uh, classes and libraries in open foam that uh, are uh, communicated uh, uh, in order to um, solve uh, for um, this uh, uh, chemistry source uh, terms. And uh, we found uh, some possible rooms for uh, improvements. Uh, for example, uh, all the uh, or most of the functions in the uh, chemistry solver uh, classes are uh, actually virtually called and um, of course uh, replacing them if possible with uh, some direct or inline uh, implementations uh, whenever uh, possible that will uh, possibly uh, help uh, especially that we call uh, these uh, these functions uh, for millions of, uh, of cells and for millions of time steps uh, another point is uh, also we have um, um, our chemistry problems are highly independent and perfectly parallelizable. So uh, there is a room to offload uh, these, um, uh, these uh, problems uh, into accelerators. Uh, these uh, are uh, still ongoing uh, works. Uh, the works that have been already done are uh, re relevant more to the load imbalance uh, which also is uh, can be very significant, uh, especially when we have um, uh, well locally um, uh, stiff uh, zones, uh, for example, um, uh, zones with uh, high uh, uh, temperature levels, uh, then uh, solving um, uh, this uh, uh, direct integration of, uh, of the chemistry problems uh, can have uh, much slower uh, conversions rates. Uh, so we need to perform uh, load balancing and also, um, as we see in this uh, basis of the integration scheme, um, uh, it involves uh, Jacobian uh, of the thermochemical state vector and um, the way uh, the Jacobian is, uh, is uh, computed and also the way uh, the Jacobian is factorized uh, is, can also be uh, a bit of, uh, of, of a bottleneck as well. So here I'm reporting quickly uh, some developments that have been made at Alto uh, by Dr. Bulut Tedbul and colleagues. Um, uh, it's uh, shown here uh, how um, uh, an unbalanced uh, um, uh, chemistry uh, um, uh, problems uh, in uh, in various um, uh, uh, processes uh, can be uh, uh, better. Um, um, 
uh, dealt with or better handled um, uh, by uh, uh, using point-to-point -point communications uh, with uh, MPI routines to uh, send the um, um, uh, the uh, processes with uh, higher computational load to uh, other uh, idling uh, processes. And then uh, with this uh, approach, we uh, achieve about um, scaling factor up to uh, 10. And uh, then by looking uh, into the uh, Jacobian matrix, um, we note uh, that um, uh, the numerical Jacobian evaluation scales uh, as the um, um, uh, in a quadratic manner uh, uh, as the uh, number of species in a chemical mechanism, while the analytical evaluation uh, has linear dependence on the number of reactions. So uh, apparently an analytical um, uh, evaluation of the Jacobian is uh, much better, uh, especially in um, uh, more uh, detailed uh, chemistry uh, problems. And then also for the factorization of uh, the Jacobian, this is even more uh, of a bottleneck uh, when we, uh, since it scales uh, cubically as the number of species, so efficient linear algebra routines are uh, needed um, uh, for uh, the matrix uh, factorization. When we looked into uh, uh, the snippet of uh, the code for the, um, um, the um, Jacobian uh, evaluation of uh, OpenFORM 2006. We realize here that uh, it's actually uh, semi-analytically uh, um, uh, evaluated. So uh, the temperature terms uh, in the Jacobian matrix have um, um, are evaluated using finite differencing. So uh, when we replace the, the uh, routines of uh, the chemical Jacobian um, uh, evaluation with uh, uh, another third part, uh, party library, uh, PyJack, we achieved already uh, almost one order of magnitude uh, speed up, um, uh, regardless of the uh, absolute tolerance that, uh, that was uh, uh, set for the uh, standard combustion, uh, for the standard chemistry model. Uh, furthermore, uh, the implementation of uh, or the raw implementation of uh, the Jacobian uh, factorization was tailored to this uh, um, uh, type of uh, semi-analytical formulations. Uh, when we use uh, analytical formulation, uh, then we have a rather dense uh, matrix and then we needed uh, better uh, routines also to um, uh, to perform the LU decomposition and back substitution. And that is why uh, also LAPAC uh, library was coupled. Um, and uh, then we achieve better uh, performance uh, or uh, uh, faster convergence rates, especially at tighter uh, absolute tolerances. This work is also uh, available in physics of fluids by uh, Ilya Morif and uh, colleagues. So back to uh, our main problem, uh, we needed to perform this uh, quasi-embedded uh, uh, DNS approach. Um, we have uh, quite expensive um, uh, computational mesh, um, uh, about 316 uh, million cells uh, associated with uh, over 900, 950 uh, million faces. Uh, the domain is decomposed into uh, about 11,000 cores, um, where uh, almost uh, 29,000 cells uh, per uh, subdomain or per core uh, were uh, used. And uh, therefore, we needed also to profile the uh, performance uh, for this kind of uh, highly parallelized um, uh, combustion system. So uh, this um, uh, nice plot shows uh, a linear scaling uh, for um, our uh, simulation, uh, starting from um, about 200 uh, cells, uh, 200,000 cells per core uh, down to about 30,000 uh, cells per core. And we have uh, nicely uh, linear scalability uh, thanks to uh, various, uh, uh, HPC uh, uh, strategies that uh, that we have used here. Uh, one of them is um, uh, the hardware architecture itself that uh, that we have been uh, using um, the Mahdi supercomputer in the uh, Finnish uh, IT Center of Science. It has uh, efficient interconnect and uh, also low latency, so uh, the network traffic was uh, rather efficient. Then uh, also the dynamic load balancing was uh, was quite um, uh, important um, uh, software opt uh, optimal uh, design uh, decision here. Uh, and then uh, also uh, another point uh, is uh, the linear solvers uh, in open foam 
it's known also to be uh, uh, highly sensitive to uh, the memory bandwidth uh, in our um, uh, uh, in our simulation. So uh, uh, in our case, we used half uh, populated nodes uh, to allow for large uh, memory channels uh, per uh, per task. Uh, another point is uh, the uh, efficient uh, parallel I/O, and also the, the I/O was uh, was tested in this um, uh, in this uh, profiling as well. Um, and uh, here we used uh, the uh, multi-collated uh, format, which uh, has been developed already by uh, Matthias Jensen's, uh, um, uh, and um, um, we did some uh, tests, and we realized that. Um, uh, using um, uh, a single um, uh, thread uh, per computing node um, uh, leads to um, uh, optimal uh, uh, parallel I/O uh, with uh, with minimized um, uh, I/O overhead uh, across uh, the computing nodes. Uh, we also try to test some uh, high-level I/O libraries such as the HDF5, but um, uh, there, there, it was a bit debatable to be used um, uh, in uh, highly parallelized systems. So uh, we restricted that to uh, only 2D cut planes uh, in the post-processing phase. Uh, a final note is um, the multi-collated um, uh, implementation is POSIX-based. Uh, we expect uh, using MPI I/O uh, um, implementation uh, to um, achieve better performance but in our case uh, uh, as we uh, uh, report here uh, we still achieved uh, uh, a linear scaling uh, uh, in in a global manner so uh, this was still uh, uh, fine uh, with with us uh, a quick um, uh, walk through uh, for the uh, physics uh, we uh, monitor here the uh, ignition kernel uh, development uh, towards um, uh, uh, possibly uh, um, uh, other uh, combustion uh, modes, um, uh, which also will be uh, uh, seen in the in the following uh, slides. Uh, we uh, show here the uh, turbulent combustion regime on uh, Borgi Peters uh, diagram, and um, uh, most of the data are uh, centered in the wrinkled uh, corrugated uh, uh, flamelet regime uh, at the um, uh, the uh, uh, spray ignition uh, phase we expect uh, uh, the uh, uh, the uh, peak to be uh, uh, shifted to the laminar uh, zone as time uh, uh, progresses later on uh, then we uh, performed the different analysis uh, either locally or statistically to uh, monitor the uh, combustion mode development and here uh, we show uh, how uh, for example in the uh, figure on the bottom uh, how the uh, reaction front uh, uh, propagation speed uh, can uh, uh, change uh, drastically from a uh, much higher uh, value at uh, the uh, spray uh, uh, auto ignition uh, phase. And this also uh, uh, suggests that we have uh, at this uh, zone a spontaneous uh, uh, front uh, propagation, while uh, later on uh, it converges to a reference uh, laminar uh, flame speed so uh, it indicates uh, more a deflagrative mode or uh, let's say slow uh, uh, combustion propagation uh, at uh, the uh, earlier phases uh, then we also implemented uh, what is called the chemical explosive mode analysis uh, it's um, um, a sophisticated uh, tool uh, for uh, combustion mode uh, identification and um, it's based on the eigen decomposition uh, of the uh, chemical jacobian matrix i won't go through uh, the details of uh, of this um, uh, uh, of this uh, uh, methodology due to uh, time but uh, I would like to say that uh, it's also publicly available in the uh, package uh, SEMA foam, um, and it's uh, it's an open foam library, so uh, it's uh, expected to to work for um, uh, standard uh, chemistry models, uh, uh, and uh, it's validated against um, some benchmark zero uh, D and one D. Uh, uh, data. Uh, an important note is that uh, uh, since uh, the uh, SEMA is uh, mainly based on the eigen decomposition of the uh, chemical Jacobian matrix, so actually uh, this is another uh, reason why the analytical formulation is also uh, more important uh, in our case. And um, here we uh, note uh, on the left side how the um, 
uh, the numerical uh, uh, evaluation or the numerical Jacobian uh, based uh, SEMA implementation uh, can have some uh, discrepancies uh, to um, uh, to uh, capture the, the flame front while uh, on the uh, analytical uh, based for uh, implementation, uh, we have uh, uh, much better uh, uh, results. Uh, here quickly also the um, uh, some of the results uh, using SEMA. Uh, the red color indicates auto ignition uh, based. So this is at the uh, beginning of um, uh, of the uh, uh, simulation, uh, and and later on it uh, transitions into deflagration uh, based uh, 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 flames, uh, which is uh, depicted in the green color. Uh, finally, we also introduce another. Um, um, criterion uh, to uh, uh, distinguish uh, uh, the combustion modes between auto ignition and flame propagation. And here we um, uh, compare the results, which is in the bottom uh, uh, row with the SEMA results. And as we see, uh, we have very nicely um, uh, similar uh, uh, results uh, for the uh, auto ignition and the uh, deflagration uh, based. So uh, to conclude, uh, we have uh, utilized open foam to perform local numerical microscopy of uh, dual fuel combustion. Uh, we use the embedded quasi-DNS approach um, uh, in order to uh, uh, have a fully uh, resolved uh, uh, simulation. Uh, we had a highly parallelized system uh, using over 300 million cells and over 950 million faces. Uh, we demonstrated uh, various uh, HPC strategies to uh, uh, to achieve a linear uh, scaling uh, with uh, about 11,000 cores. And finally, uh, we also uh, uh, monitor uh, or note uh, uh, the uh, combustion mode uh, development uh, from uh, auto ignition based to uh, deflagration and um, um, uh, using uh, also uh, um, a newly implemented uh, uh, method, uh, the chemical explosive uh, mode analysis, which is already available in the literature and the implementation is um, uh, is uh, publicly uh, uh, available, uh, or the incorporation to open form is publicly available in the Alto CFD uh, GitHub organization. So uh, as a final note, uh, this is the uh, organization uh, on GitHub uh, that includes uh, the uh, DLB form uh, library and, and the SEMA form. Uh, uh, DLB form uh, is a bit more uh, known and uh, it's uh, uh, collective efforts that, uh, that have started at, at Alto uh, since uh, many years uh, ago. So at this point, I would like to thank the audience and uh, if there are any questions. Thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Are there any questions in the audience? Uh, thank you, Mahmoud, for uh, your very interesting talk because I think that dual fuel combustion is something that still requires a lot of understanding, unfortunately, because uh, you, know, you don't know which kind of flame propagates. Uh, I have a question DLB form. And mm -hmm. first of all, I thank Alto because sharing it, uh, I could use it. So say thanks so much. Have you compared the performance of DLB form against the, the TDAC library in uh, which is available in the foundation version? Because I think they have similar performance, at least for what I've found with the uh, like Yao mechanism, for example. Uh, you mean computational wise? Yes. Uh, I think it's, uh, at least to my knowledge, uh, we have not compared the performance, but um, uh, also we have uh, totally different uh, techniques, right? For for computing mm -hmm. the, the chemistry. So yes. um, it would be it would be definitely interesting to 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 test that at some point, and I think uh, there have been also some um, uh, interest to uh, actually uh, implement the load balancing also for the TDAC uh, itself. Yeah, uh, and I think this will be even uh, more interesting to. To my opinion, I think that uh, because I think that DAC gives a strong speed up. Seriously, mm -hmm. of course, ISAT is another problem. When it do diffuses combust, in ice, it is not happening a lot. But that is strongly reducing the CPU time. My, mm -hmm. Let's say, I think that the effort, to my opinion, should be to try to combine DLB foam and DAC if possible. 
because I think that this could really be the the the, the way to make things uh, seriously faster. I actually uh, I, I totally agree, and um, I have been also thinking about uh, some. I think some previous works also have uh, tried to um, uh, do some sort of adaptive. Uh, uh, strategies uh, for the um, uh, chemistry uh, solution uh, based on the, um, uh, the the combustion mode and also uh, maybe the the zones of interest. Um, so I mean, on top of uh, what what you have said, I think also that um, moving uh, toward a uh, uh, adaptive uh, 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 dynamic adaptive uh, uh, selector uh, of uh, of the combustion model. Uh, um, uh, where uh, in some zones uh, we would be more interested in uh, using finite rate chemistry with uh, maybe larger uh, mechanisms, while in, in other zones uh, uh, tabulation is uh, is more uh, more relevant. Um, I have been also trying to to look into that uh, at some point and um, uh, may, maybe using. Um, uh, uh, some um, uh, machine learning uh, uh, based uh, algorithms also can can be uh, interesting in, in in this scope but uh, yeah uh, in general it's it's definitely uh, interesting to to combine uh, tabulation and and uh, finite rate chemistry Yes, I was meaning a dynamic adaptive chemistry, so an online reduction of the mechanism together with the DLP. This is what I was meaning. Ah, not, okay. Not okay. tabulation. Okay, okay, meaning, okay, okay. Yes. Meaning what is already available, probably, let's say, combining them can help. Mm, mm, mm. Yes. But yes. Thank you true. for your answer. Very useful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Then I'll just quickly check if our online audience has any questions. It seems that we are good. Thank you very much. Thank for you. The talk. Okay, our last talk of the day will be delivered by Dr. Dominic Lahaye from the Technical University of Delft and the the title of the presentation is uh, Turbulent Reactive Flow in a Cement Kiln. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, dear audience uh, in the room and online. Thank you very much for attending my presentation. This will be a talk about an application in industry. We are trying to simulate a cement furnace and how the combustion happens or does occur inside of the cement furnace. Here you see a schematic representation of the device we are interested in modeling. It is a long cylinder. In our case, it's 40 meters long, about three meters in diameter. It revolves around its axis. So it has the role of mixing but also has the role of a heat exchange. That is, material comes inside of the oven on the far cold end of the furnace. It travels through the cylinder. It is being heated. It's being mixed. It undergoes sintering reactions and leaves the furnace as intermediate product to be processed further into cement. The first speaker talked about sintering. I will consider for time being the furnace to be empty. That is, I consider only the problem of the heat transfer in the furnace. The way that the furnace is being heated is by combustion of natural gas in a non-premixed mode. That is, the natural gas, this is a furnace being installed in the harbor 
of Rotterdam. The Netherlands had long time Dutch natural gas. So that's the type of fuel being used for the combustion. That fuel enters through the burner through a system of multiple nozzles. That's where the gas goes through. We also have a separate um, air inlet that is mounted elsewhere in, in the furnace. So we'll have a typical non-premixed diffusion flame. And the question is, how hot does it get in, in, in the furnace? And can we steer, for instance, the oxygen or can we steer the fuel composition to be able to obtain desired temperature distribution in the oven? Um, let me uh, give you an idea of, I think, I, okay. Uh, here is a view of the mesh used for simulations. Professor Lucchini talked to us about mesh generation in case that the uh, nozzles are not inclined or, or not directed in the direction of the main coordinate axis. In our case, we have multiple nozzles in different directions. So therefore, we have a refinement zone close to the burner axis that's in the central part of the of the of the furnace, and we have on top above the burner pipe the air inlet. Let me give you more explanation of how the nozzles at the burner how they are oriented. So we have, in our case, a multi-jet burner. It is our burner consists in total of uh, 16 um, nozzles, of which eight are directed with the main axis of, of, the, of the cylinder. And we have eight that are outwardly inclined. And we need to deal with the fact that the nozzles are small, typically uh, half a centimeter to one centimeter on the furnace of 40 meters. So obviously there is a challenge of mesh generation. Here we have the other view on the mesh. Which, where you see the burner pipe. At the end, you see the, the burner with the different nozzles. You also, also see the cooling slot around the, the burner nozzles. And you see on top the uh, rectangular air inlet through which preheated air enters the furnace. Uh, more views on the, on the on the mesh. Again, the the zoom near the burner. More detailed view, and here you see a cross section of the um, on a size perpendicular to the main axis. Okay, uh, we have here a mesh generation using CF mesh. Uh, we talked a lot to the main developer of CF Mesh to be able to do the mesh generation. Uh, it is, we can do different meshes of different uh, cell numbers. In this case, we use a mesh of uh, a bit more than 1 million cells. What are the objectives of our study? Short-term objective is, given that the harbor is in a zone where residential areas are located, we want to uh, minimize the emissions of the furnace. In this case, we want to minimize the thermal NO emissions. But further on, in, in the situation of a 
energy transition, a move away from fossil fuels. We want to understand how to, what can be done to minimize the carbon impact or the, or the, the climate impact of these types of installations and therefore understand issues of mixing of the flow, understand how to do the combustion modeling and the radiative heat transfer in the freeboard of the, of the furnace, but also the heat transfer to the material. So the different aspects that are on the longer, uh, longer scope research objectives. What model have we implemented thus far? We are working with a unsteady runs formulation. Important here is unsteady because due to the um, burner having a large mass flow in, 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 inflow rate, the flow is no longer a steady flow. There are fluctuations that we cannot capture unless we use a unsteady formulation. And we use for time being a standard Capchidon turbulence model. The flow width is transonic, again, due to the um, due to the high mass flow rate. So our Mach number is about 0 0.5, 0 0.7. And we use at the outlet a uh, wave transmissive boundary conditions to avoid that the pressure field reflects back into the into domain and hampers the convergence of the simulations. The combustion occurs in a non, non premix mode. So we have the fusion flames. We model that for time being by an anti dissipation model. We simplify the fuel to be methane with a simple step reaction, simple single step reaction mechanism. Radiative heat transfer is done by a P1 model with standard coefficients. And we do Zeldovich for the thermal NO post processing. Implementation open foam is done by recting foam. Uh, as we know, recting foam. However, the, uh, the pressure solved in recting foam is the part that takes away most of the CPU time in the current simulations. And we saw during this week various opportunities to reduce the CPU time of that pressure solve inside of the simple algorithm. To be able to compute thermal NO, we have a separate thermal NO post processing solver, which is called NOX foam. Operating conditions used in this presentation, we use for this case fuel rich composition, which is obviously not realistic because it would be a waste for the company to operate in a fuel rich mode. However, we consider this to be a academic base test case for future work. What do we see in our simulations? We first look at the temperature field. What you see is a cold air flowing in on top. This is the air inflow. And you see a hot zone being formed near the burner outlet. You also see a streak of high temperatures above the burner pipe. This is because there is a recirculation in how the um, air and fuel jets merge 
causing part of the methane to flow backwards in towards the air inlet. At the moment, we have also running um, more re realistic simulations in which we have increased the volumetric inflow rate of air. If you increase the volumetric inflow rate of air, we have that this streak of high temperature disappears and the longer flame does emerge. Here you have a visualization of the streamlines. You see how the multiple jets from the burner and from the uh, combustion air, the jet mix and gives rise to different recirculation patterns in, in the foods. Here we have a pot of thermal kinetic energy. We like the picture, so we wanted to share it with you. This is the, 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 how the kinetic energy, thermal kinetic energy is generated due to the multiple jets at the burner. Here we have the, um, the combustion heat source. Essentially, this is what generates the heat due to the combustion and what gives rise to, uh, to the temperature in the furnace. We have the mass fraction of methane. Um, so because the, uh, the case we consider here is fuel rich, we arrive at the outlet with still an amount of methane that is too much to be realistic, right? However, we wanted to have this case first as a baseline to have the further improvements to be made later. Uh, we have the computed uh, mass fraction of oxygen where you see that where the oxygen meets the methane, a reaction front is being formed. And you see this, this thin zone encircled in red of the reaction front. And you see the thermal NO concentration. Thermal NO at the outlet is zero again, due to the academic setup of the case, which we hope to improve or which is currently being improved by more realistic simulations. The flow in the kiln is unsteady. This is why we use a unsteady runs formulation. And our interest was in quantifying at what frequencies the fields in the furnace are changing. Therefore, we looked into time traces of various quantities along the main axis of the furnace. So you see here the time trace of the pressure field along six locations along the central axis of, of, the, of, of the furnace. Uh, we are starting the numbering. So we start the um, small values of Y correspond to locations close to the burner. So as, you, as Y increases, you move through the cylinder towards the, toward the bird. What you see is that, if you look at time traces, is that close to the burner, the pressure is fluctuating with a higher amplitude as expected. And we looked at how the, um, what, what the frequency content is of these pressure fluctuations. At the inlet, 
the pressure varies at multiple frequencies, but as you move closer to the outlet, at the outlet, only one frequency does remain. And we were able to link the frequency of the pressure field at the outlet with a resonant frequency of a cylinder. So there's a there's a there's an intuition there of why the peak should be there. We can do the same thing obviously for other fields. Here you have the actual velocity in the cylinder. So the velocity field has an x, y, and z component. The y component is the actual component. And we can again look at how it varies in space, sorry, how it varies with time and frequency. What you see is that close to the uh, burner, you have variations at high amplitude. Again, close to the burden, we have multiple frequencies. If you do a uh, if you do a frequency analysis of the of the velocity unknown, and close close to the uh, outlet or at the outlet, the velocity in actual direction has again this resonant uh, frequency but also other low frequency modes. And we don't, we're still looking for a good explanation to explain why these low frequency modes do remain at the output. Probably this has to do with how the mixing occurs in the furnace. And you can do the same thing also for the other velocity components. Uh, velocity components at the outlet have uh, only the high frequency. Sorry. Okay. So the velocity components that are transversal, so the x and z velocity, have frequency components at lower frequency. The resonant frequency has a much lower amplitude for the transverse velocity components. And we can do the same thing for temperature. Uh, temperature is varying at a much lower frequency. To conclude, we looked into the non-premixed combustion in a furnace for cement production. We used um, a public domain mesh generator, which is in this case CF mesh. We used reacting foam. We have discovered that the um, flow to the nozzles causes the flow to be unsteady. And we needed to have wave transmissive boundary conditions to avoid spurious reflections at the outlet patch. Um, with, this, with, with this, we have now a stable convergence of the flow simulation and combustion and radiation uh, in, in the furnace. And we are obtaining uh, more realistic results for more realistic operating conditions. So we are happy to have come thus far. I uh, will be happy to update you in the next communication about the more realistic operating conditions. You have been a lovely audience. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Lahaya, for this interesting talk. Yes, and we will be looking forward to seeing you at the next uh, conference to see where this study is going. Uh, are there any questions from the audience? Uh, thank you, Domenico, for uh, your uh, 
interesting presentation because seventh kiln are now the, the next challenge of combustion modeling it seems uh, you have used the eddy dissipation concept yes with a single species yes exactly yes uh, do you think uh, you are going to improve to evolve the the modeling of combustion or it's kind of analysis that maybe combustion model is already fine uh it's certainly certainly it's not the end goal to stick to EVC signal step. Um, having EVC, we can easily switch to all the reaction mechanisms because everything is there already. You talk to you talk you mentioned the reduction mechanism as well, so that also might be used. So yes, we want to certainly uh, make a step also in the representation of the fuel and the reaction mechanism. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, then I think that we are perfectly in time. And with this talk, I would like to conclude this session. So the next on the agenda is the lunch break. So let's go.